Between 2002 and 2004, Yu-Gi-Oh! released six starter decks that featured cards used by iconic anime characters. In 2005, they introduced structure decks, which had a more cohesive strategy in mind. When done correctly, structure decks can be some of Yu-Gi-Oh!'s best products. Ideally, they'll have great reprints as well as multiple powerful new cards, and hopefully they'll give their theme a chance at competing in events on a budget. For the most part, modern structure decks do a decent job at meeting these goals but that hasn't always been the case. The first 10 structure decks were released worldwide between 2005 and 2007 in both the TCG and OCG formats. These early structure decks were packed full of reprints and also had a mixed bag of new cards, including an exciting new ultra rare boss monster. The vast majority of these old school structure deck boss monsters sadly did not see any sort of competitive use at events back in the day. It's no surprise that these cards don't compare well to newer boss boss monsters, but today I want to specifically focus on how strong they were during their initial release. On January 1st, 2005, they released both Dragon's Roar and Zombie Madness. Let's start with Dragon's Roar. Red Eyes Darkness Dragon is a level 9 dark dragon monster with 2400 attack and 2000 defense. It says, cannot be normal summoned or set, must be special summoned from your hand by tributing one Red Eyes Black Dragon, gains 300 attack for each dragon monster in your graveyard. On release, Red Eyes Black Dragon was not very competitive. There were plenty of other two tribute monsters that had way more attack, such as Blue Eyes, but there were even one tribute monsters that had more attack as well, such as Summon Skull. Because of this, it's no surprise that they tried to boost the power of Red Eyes Black Dragon with this very first structure deck. And while they did try, I wouldn't say that they were that successful. Within the structure deck, the main combo here was using Red Eyes B Chick to summon the Red Eyes Black Dragon from your hand, and then tributing that Red Eyes Black Dragon to summon the Red Eyes Darkness Dragon. Luckily, the deck included three copies of Masked Dragon, which was a pretty good way to get to the chick, but the challenge here was getting both Red Eyes B Dragon and Red Eyes Darkness Dragon to your hand at the same time. You wouldn't really want to put too many copies of either of them into your deck because they were basically just bricks, but you would want to play enough copies to consistently see both of them if you had the Red Eyes B Chick. The on-field effect of this monster is not very relevant, the attack boost is way too low, but even if you did pull the combo off, Darkness Dragon lost really hard to commonly played back row at the time like Torrential Tribute and Mere Force. While this card was released during old school Yu-Gi-Oh, it is important to remember that at this point in Yu-Gi-Oh's history, we are in a post-invasion of chaos environment. This entire combo was very behind the times, even by 2005 standards. Zombie Madness was definitely the better structure deck of the two. Pyramid Turtle into Ryu Koki was basically better than anything that the Red Eyes deck was capable of. Let's take a look at the boss monster though, Vampire Genesis. This is a level 8 dark zombie monster with 3000 attack and 2100 defense. It says, cannot be normal summoned or set, must be special summoned from your hand by banishing one vampire lord you control, and cannot be special summoned by other ways. Once per turn, you can discard one zombie type monster to the graveyard, then target one zombie monster in your graveyard with a level less than the discarded monster's special summon that target. When compared to Red Eyes Darkness Dragon, Vampire Genesis certainly looks better. Pyramid Turtle can special summon Vampire Lord right from your deck, so you don't have the same issue of having to draw both Vampire Genesis and Vampire Lord at the same time. Not to mention that before the release of Cyber Dragon, Vampire Lord was just a good one tribute monster that people actually actually played. I also think that the on-field effect of Genesis is pretty decent. Discarding a monster to revive a monster is a classic effect in Yu-Gi-Oh, but especially for zombies, so you would think that this card would be right at home in existing zombie decks. But I think the main drawback here is that you just didn't need it. It was kind of win more. At this point, they had tons of revival, including three Book of Life, so zombie decks already had a way to flood the board with monsters from the graveyard. Vampire Genesis was one of the better bosses boss monsters released in these early structure decks, but it wasn't quite good enough to make the cut at actual tournaments. Even with that said though, the Zombie Madness structure deck was still very good, featuring a ton of powerful zombie type monsters and support. A few months later, on May 9th, we got another pair of structure decks, Blaze of Destruction and Fury from the Deep. The Blaze of Destruction boss monster was Infernal Flame Emperor, a level 9 fire pyro monster with 2700 attack and 1600 defense. Cannot be special 
Elemental Summoned. When this card is Tribute Summoned, you can banish up to five fire monsters from your graveyard, destroy spell and traps on the field equal to the number banished to activate this effect. Most of the cards in this deck are either designed to burn the opponent like Solar Flare Dragon and Backfire, or to hit the opponent with a lot of damage from an attack like Ultimate Baseball Kid or Gaia Soul. Infernal Flame Emperor doesn't really fall into either one of these categories, and honestly there aren't too many ways to load up the graveyard with fire monsters for its effect. Pretty much the only way to quickly fill your graveyard with five fire monsters is by crashing a bunch of UFO turtles into your opponent's cards. I think the idea here is that you clear the back row so cards like Ultimate Baseball Kid have an easier time attacking, but even in that way, I think it kind of falls short of helping because you don't have a ton of ways to spam the board with monsters, which means it's kind of difficult to actually get to two tributes that you want to tribute. You wouldn't really want to tribute cards like Solar Flare Dragon that are locking down your opponent and doing burn damage, and you also don't want to tribute Baseball Kid or Raging Flame Sprite because those incrementally gain attack points. It almost seems like at the last minute, this card was changed from doing burn damage to destroying back row because I can picture a world where this does like three to 500 burn damage for each card banished, which would make it a pretty decent finisher. With its actual effect though, it seems out of place. In Fury from the Deep, we got Ocean Dragon Lord Neo Daedalus, a level eight water sea serpent monster with 2,900 attack and 1,600 defense. This card cannot be normal summoned or set. This card cannot be special summoned except by tributing one Levia Dragon Daedalus. You can send one Umi you control to the graveyard to send all cards in both players' hands and on the field to the graveyard except this card. The on-field effect of this card is obviously strong. It's essentially Chaos Emperor Dragon for water monsters. The summoning condition on this card is where it falls short, and hilariously, the first edition print of this card didn't actually have that. They forgot to put it on there. You could like mail in your copy to get the regular text, but to be completely honest, I don't know why you would want a worse version of the card that you pulled. Officially, no matter what the text is, it still requires the tribute of the Levia Dragon, but on the playground, your friends might have not known about that effect. The main issue with the summoning condition is that Levia Dragon Daedalus already has almost this effect. It only destroys cards on the field, not the hand, but that's honestly fine, and if you have a Legendary Ocean on the board, which you should, that's the entire point of the deck, then it only takes one tribute because it becomes a level 6 monster. The added effect of getting rid of both players' hands wasn't worth putting a potential brick in your deck when you already had a boss monster that was almost as good. Maybe if it got rid of only your opponent's hand and not yours, then it would have been a little bit more playable, but as it stands, it's just not worth it. On October 28th, 2005, we got Warrior's Triumph. The boss monster of this deck was Guilford the Legend, a level 8 Earth Warrior monster with 2600 attack and 2000 defense. Cannot be special summoned. When this card is normal summoned, you can equip as many equipped spell cards from your graveyard as possible to a warrior type monster or monsters you control. And note here, it doesn't even have to equip cards to itself, it allows you to equip stuff to whatever warrior type monsters you have on the board. And this structure deck did have Armed Samurai Benki, which is a great tool for OTK in the opponent. But even besides that, if you're equipping five cards from your graveyard to monsters you control, that is a huge plus in card advantage. There are a few problems here. There isn't a way to really get to equip spells at all besides naturally drawing them. The deck even includes two copies of Reload, which I'm pretty sure is a way to try to dig towards your combos, but that's not really ideal. Also, kind of like with the Fire Structure deck, this one doesn't really have a way to facilitate tribute summons consistently, so the Guilford the Legend might not work as often as you would like. On January 18th, 2006, we got Spellcaster's Judgment, a deck that featured spellcasters and spell counters. The cover card on this was Dark Eradicator Warlock, a level 7 dark spellcaster monster with 2500 attack and 2100 defense, the Dark Magician stats. Cannot be normal summoned or set, must be special summoned from your hand by tributing one Dark Magician and cannot be special summoned by other ways. Each time a normal spell card is activated, inflict 1000 damage to your opponent immediately after it resolves. We've seen this summoning condition a few times in today's video, and this one isn't the worst of them, just because this deck actually has a fair amount of good access to Dark Magician. There are two copies of both Skilled Dark Magician and Magical Dimension in this deck, which are pretty good ways to summon it. But even though it's not too difficult to summon, when it's on the board, it doesn't really do that much. 1000 
damage is a lot, but it only works with normal spells and you'd have to activate eight of them to reduce the opponent's life points to zero. And the fact that it only works with normal spells is pretty annoying. This deck has all sorts of different spells in it, not just normal spells. Early Yu-Gi-Oh had plenty of decks that were capable of FTKing the opponent, and compared to those, Dark Eradicator Warlock just never looked that good. A few months later, on May 15th, we got Structure Deck Invincible Fortress. This was a rock deck that focused on defense mode monsters, flipping themselves face up and face down. Exod, Master of the Guard, was the boss monster. It's a level 8 earth rock monster with 0 attack and 4,000 defense. This card cannot be normal summoned or set. This card cannot be special summoned except by tributing one Sphinx monster. Each time an earth monster is flip summoned while this card remains face up on the field, inflict 1,000 damage to your opponent. The Sphinx monsters in this deck are not great. Guardian Sphinx is probably the best one, but the other two are pretty much unplayable. All of these are one tribute monsters, which means to get out Exod, you have to first perform a regular tribute summon and then tribute that monster to summon this big boss. But with Exod, you want to have a board of a ton of rock monsters to flip up and face down to burn your opponent. So to get this to work, you really have to have so much card advantage that you have not only enough tribute materials, but also enough cards to actually flip. And maybe if the core strategy of this structure deck was a bit better, that wouldn't be as big of an ask, but the cards in this deck are just not good. Many of the rock monsters that have effects on flip are only triggering those when they're flip summoned, which means if your opponent just attacks them while face down, you don't get their ability. I think the idea here is that you have a combination of these flip monsters alongside monsters with 2000 defense, so your opponent doesn't know what to attack, but in practice, these cards just were terrible. The better way to win with Exod would probably just be ignoring its effect entirely and swapping its stats with cards like Great Spirit or Shield and Sword, but that's still a multi-card combo that doesn't really do too much besides put a big body on the field. In the summer of 2006, on July 12th, we got Structure Deck Lord of the Storm. This deck featured Wind Monsters, cards that could bounce your opponent's back row, and Harpy Ladies. The boss monster in this one is Samorg, Bird of Divinity, a level 7 wind winged beast monster with 2700 attack and 1000 defense. This card cannot be special summoned. If you tribute summon this card, all tributes must be wind. Each player takes 1000 damage during each of their end phases while this card remains face up on the field. This damage is decreased by 500 for each spell and trap card the player controls. I want to start by saying if this card just did 1000 damage to each player during their end phases, it would already be terrible. But when you also add on that the players can decrease it by having back row, it just gets even worse. I don't really know what they were thinking when they designed this monster. On October 28th, 2006, we got Dinosaur's Rage, which included Superconductor Tyranno. This is a level 8 light dinosaur monster with 3300 attack and 1400 defense. Here's what it does. Once per turn, you can tribute one monster, inflict 1000 damage to your opponent. This card cannot declare an attack the turn this effect is activated. For the first time in this video, we are looking at a boss monster that does not have a summoning requirement or a summoning restriction. That being said, at this point in Yu-Gi-Oh's history, dinosaurs don't really have playable cards. The combo in the structure deck was to use this alongside Black Terra to basically have an infinite resource engine to keep tributing, but that didn't go too well because the rest of the supporting dinosaurs weren't very good, and also because that is incredibly slow. We are at this point almost a decade away from dinosaurs actually getting good support, and because of that, Superconductor Tyranno just didn't really stand a chance. Finally, on January 17th, 2007, we got Machine Revolt, which featured Ancient Gear monsters as well as the debut of the gadgets. The boss monster from this structure deck was Ancient Gear Gajiltron Dragon? Gajiltron Dragon? I don't know. It's a level 8 Earth Machine monster with 3,000 attack and 2,000 defense. It says, if this card attacks, your opponent cannot activate any spell or trap cards until the end of the damage step. This card gains the appropriate effects if you normal summon it by tributing these monsters. If you tribute Green Gadget, if this card attacks a defense position monster, inflict piercing battle damage to your opponent. If you tributed Red Gadget, if this card inflicts battle damage to your opponent, inflict 400 damage to your opponent. And if you tributed Yellow Gadget, if this card destroys an opponent's monster by battle, inflict 600 damage to your opponent. This card has the 
basic ancient gear effect on attack declaration and then also can potentially gain bonuses. Now in reality, the tributing of gadgets wasn't the most common way to summon this, but it is basically the only card in today's video that did see competitive play. Not necessarily next to too many other cards from this structure deck, but eventually when we got Gear Town, there were several decks that tried using that card alongside this card to close out games. They didn't really play any other Ancient Gear cards, but I thought it was worth mentioning. The gadgets from this deck saw tons of competitive use for many years after this structure released, but unfortunately the Ancient Gear cards at this point in Yu-Gi-Oh's history didn't really have enough support to build a competitive deck around. And with that, we have covered the first wave of structure deck boss monsters, most of which were not very good. At this point, the TCG and OCG kind of went their own direction with structure decks, which is why we're stopping here, and eventually they would morph into the structure decks that we know today. It's funny because nowadays the boss monster of a structure deck is usually one of the bigger selling points of it, but back in the day they were sometimes the worst monster in the deck. Let me know in the comments if you guys owned any of these structure decks when you were a kid and if you tried to play the boss monsters, I'd love to hear how that went. For me personally, it didn't go that well. Anyway though, thank you guys so much for watching today's video. I'll catch you later. Goodbye.